we have spent uh, some time talking about how viruses cause disease, and we've talked a bit about how the immune response can protect against infection. And today I want to talk about how we can mobilize the immune response to protect us using vaccines. Our life expectancy has gone up considerably since 1900 when men and women lived to be about 40 or 50 years old. Today, we can both live over 70 years, and this increased life expectancy has many origins, but a big one is medical and public health interventions, particularly preventing infectious diseases that would often kill people uh, in their 30s. And these are viruses and bacteria, and now we have vaccines against them. So we live long because of science and technology. And vaccination is the way we use our immune response to protect against infection. And particularly, we generate immune memory so that if we encounter a pathogen, we get a quick response. And basically what vaccination does by providing memory breaks the chain of transmission. If you have an immune population, the virus cannot travel through it, it can't transmit through it, so there will be less virus disease. And we've talked before about immune memory. This is, a, again, uh, a typical antibody response. We're looking at uh, antibodies or, or cells, immune cells, with time. When we get a first infection, we have an adaptive response, which takes 7 to 14 days to engage. Too late to do much for the first infection, but we're left with immune memory. So if we have another infection many years later, the adaptive response is activated immediately. There's no delay, and the antibodies or cells can then uh, prevent a serious infection. You will have some virus replication, of course, but you will not have disease. And this is how uh, vaccines work. The first vaccine was really made by Jenner, although, as I'll tell you in a moment, the practice probably took place many years before. Uh, in 1796, he immunized a boy against smallpox using cowpox pustules. Now, cowpox is a disease of cows. and It was known that milkmaids got lesions on their hands from the cowpox from milking cows, but they never got smallpox. So Jenner made a very interesting and logical deduction that perhaps whatever was calling smallpox, causing smallpox, and of course, we didn't know in 1796 that it was a virus, Whatever was causing smallpox could be prevented by getting cowpox. So we got a young boy, he inoculated the boy uh, in the skin with cowpox material taken from uh, a, a pustule. And then 14 days later, he challenged the boy with smallpox. It was easy to get smallpox back then because almost everyone got infected and you would have the lesions all over your body. And the boy was protected, amazingly. And he picked 14 days, and that was perfect because it was enough time to get an adaptive response and have lots of antibodies. And that was the first modern-day vaccine. Uh, many years later, when Louis Pasteur developed the rabies vaccine, he coined the name vaccine, which contains the Latin word vaca for cow, in honor of uh, Jenner. And this is a, what w was used many years later to immunize against smallpox, uh, it's a bifurcated needle. You put a drop of vaccine in it and you scrape the outer uh, layers of skin. The virus gets down into the epidermis where it replicates quite well. And I have my smallpox scar on my arm. Uh, though none of you probably do unless you were in the military. Um, and we've stopped immunizing against smallpox in 1979 because the virus has been eradicated. Since this first immunization, and I should say that in the 11th century, uh, the Chinese practiced what was called variol variolation. They did a similar thing as Jenner. They took, but they used smallpox pustules and they would blow those into the nose of individuals. About 30% of them would get smallpox and die, but the rest were protected. Not a good safety index by today's vaccine standards, but it was, again, with the same logic that if you had the disease and you survived it, you wouldn't get it again. Since uh, the rabies vaccine, uh, the next ones were developed for yellow fever, influenza vaccine in the, 1913, in the 1930s. As soon as Jenner's vaccine began to be used, the anti-vaxxers came out of the woodwork. Here's an early 
cartoon from uh, Jenner's time says the cowpock or the wonderful effects of the new inoculation. And so people said, this is not a good thing. If you get Jenner's vaccine, you're going to grow cow parts uh, out of your extremities. You can see this guy has a cow growing out of his nose and here on his arm and so forth. So whenever you do something, someone will object to it. That's really the moral of this story. We have used large scale immunization efforts to stop viral infections and they're very successful. And these are two examples. On the top, uh, the incidence of poliomyelitis in the US. We used to have 20 to 30,000 cases a year before the vaccines were introduced, one in the 1950s, the other in 1961. We have no longer have polio in the US and most of the world as we'll see. Same experience with measles on the bottom. Again, number of cases with year, measles vaccine introduced in the 1960s. Uh, could eliminate measles from the U.S. if more people would take it. There's still a few remaining cases. What's really interesting in terms of measles, the chart on the right shows you the deaths that are prevented by measles vaccination because measles can kill you. So on the top is the estimated measles deaths in the absence of vaccination since about 2000 to the present. The bottom is the estimated deaths prevented or with vaccination. So these are deaths in millions on the y-axis. And you can see vaccination has prevented a lot of deaths. And the yellow bars are the deaths that have been prevented by vaccination. You can do this for nearly any disease for which we've used vaccination. It's very successful, it saves lives. So these, these campaigns are very successful. So today, vaccines are part of why we live to 70 plus years of age. Um, we immunize almost every living thing that we can get our hands on, in addition to children and adults of all ages, we immunize our farm animals, chickens and pigs, et cetera, get vaccines to prevent them from getting infections and passing them on to us. We even immunize wild animals. Anybody know how you would immunize a wild animal? Yes? You could feed them, but you don't want to trap them all and Get there. But what you do is you drop the bait into the forest. You drop vaccine-laced bait, and this is done for rabies. We immunize uh, animals in the forest with, with these vaccines. It works very well. Because of immunization, childhood diseases are rare. When I was a kid, I had all of them. I had measles, I had mumps, I had rubella, I had chicken pox. I didn't have smallpox, I did get the smallpox vaccine. And so you may say, well, you're fine, right? Why should I get immunized? Well, no, I was very lucky that I didn't die from these uh, infections. However, they did want to make me become a virologist. <laughs> no, that wasn't the reason. I've already told you the reason for that. So first world countries immunize their kids. Not everybody in the world does this. We're trying to spread it to more countries and the very wealthy of the world, the Bill Gates and so forth, give their money so that more people can be vaccinated. And this is very good because they do work. How do vaccines work? They work uh, by providing a level of immunity in the population to stop virus spread. And it's a critical level which is defined by the concept of herd immunity, which tells us you don't really need to, inf to immunize everyone in order to stop a virus from spreading, which is good because you can never immunize anyone, even in the US, even in Scandinavia, where people are very obedient, I understand, you can't immunize everyone. So herd immunity means that uh, the virus spread will stop when the probability uh, of infection drops below a critical threshold. So you don't have to immunize anyone. And the threshold depends on the virus and it depends on the population as well. So the U.S. is going to be different from uh, South American countries and so forth. So for smallpox, that threshold is about 80 to 85 percent. So if you can get people 80 to 85 percent of the population immune to smallpox, you will stop virus spread because there aren't enough people in the population to sustain the spread of the virus. If you have an infected person, there are not going to be enough people around that infected person to spread the infection. Measles is higher. You need to get 93 to 95 percent of the population immune in order to stop infection. And in part, this is due to the reproductive index, the number of people 
that a single infected person can then infect in turn. And for measles, it's very high, it's 15 or so, and that's why we have to uh, get more people immune to stop spread. And this is good for a, for a, num for a, number, a number, of, number of reasons, it's not just because you can't immunize any, everyone, but no vaccine is 100% effective. If we give a vaccine, a polio vaccine to 100 people, not all of them are going to respond for a variety of reasons, one of which is genetic. Not everyone's immune response is made equally. So for example, with measles, if you uh, vaccinate 80% of the population, 76% is immune. So if you give the vaccine to 80%, only 76% becomes immune. That 4%, that which can be millions of people, never respond. We don't know where they are, because we don't check people for response to vaccines, that would really complicate vaccination programs. Uh, but they can be infected if they're in the presence of enough other people with, um, we, who don't have immunity. But the way the herd immunity works is you can still be protected by being in a population that is largely immune to infection. A big problem with immunization, of course, is public complacency. There are all kinds of excuses for not getting immunized, some of which are shown on this slide. And this is a problem that public health authorities always have to deal with. People always have good re not good reasons, they always have reasons uh, not to be immunized, and many of them are absurd. Um, vaccines make you sick, they cause autism, MS, etc. These, these things are simply not true, but it's very difficult to persuade uh, people otherwise. Herd immunity. One, demonstrates the importance of immunizing livestock. Two, emphasizes that not everyone must be immune to protect a population. Three, emphasizes that everyone must be immune to protect the population. Four, describes how groupthink can dominate anti-vaccine choices, or all of the above. All right, 89% of you answered B, which is, emphasizes that not everyone must be immune to protect the population. Some of you answered C, everyone must be immune. No, that's the opposite, right? Herd immunity means not everyone must be immune to protect the population. Vaccines come in two general types. Can, we call them active vaccines or passive vaccines. In an active vaccine, you put a modified form of the pathogen or a part of the pathogen into the recipient and um, that generates memory, in memory immune responses, and you don't give the individual the disease as, as a consequence. Of course, vaccines have to be uh, safe, so, so they don't give you the disease, and this gives you long-term protection because it induces memory. So that's an active vaccine, and that's what we'll spend most of today talking about. But I want to tell you a little bit about passive vaccines. These is where you put the products of the immune response into a recipient either antibodies or cells, immune cells, depending on which one is important for protection. And, a very, and this gives you short-term protection because antibodies have a half-life of a month or so, depending on how you prepare them. And so it, they're good in a situation where you need to get rapid protection and the person hasn't been immunized. So a great example is uh, rabies immune globulin. If you get bitten by what you think is a rabid animal, uh, you will be injected with rabies immune globulin, which is antibody taken from people, volunteers who have been immunized with rabies vaccine and who have made antibodies to the virus. You will be injected at the bite site with this uh, antibody to try and neutralize the virus that's there. The uh, interesting th situation with rabies is that it takes so long for the virus to get into the central nervous system, about two weeks, depending on where you're bitten, that you have time to immunize as well. So you're then given an active vaccine uh, and that will generate immunity and you'll actually be protected. But the initial thing is to give uh, the passive vaccine at the bite site to help lower the amount of virus that you've acquired. We all get passive vaccines from our mothers as we are developing in utero. Uh, so this is a graph of serum immunoglobulin levels at different times from conception to adult years. And this is the fraction of adult values. And so you can see uh, the, um, the amount of uh, antibodies uh, in the baby are, are very low. 
So IgM is the purple line, IgG, uh, the blue, and IgA, the, the yellow line. So at about six months of uh, development, the, the fetus begins to make uh, IgM. But at birth, right here, uh, the IgG and IgA levels are very low, and IgM is very low as well. The immune system simply hasn't developed to the point where it can make protective levels of these antibodies. So the mother donates uh, antibodies. This is maternally transferred IgG in red. And this peaks at about uh, eight months of development. And when the baby is born, it has a complement of antibodies from the mother, which reflects her experience with pathogens. Because if she's never been infected with anything, you're not going to give much protectin. But in reality, uh, she does have antibodies to a variety of pathogens. And of course, if she's been immunized, she will have those as well. So this is a naturally occurring passive vaccine. A very famous passive vaccine is called ZMAP. Anybody heard of ZMAP? Yes? ZMAP surfaced when two workers in Western Africa got infected with Ebola. And all of a sudden, everyone heard about this. It was called the secret serum initially. But all it is is a cocktail of three different monoclonal antibodies that bind the glycoprotein of Ebola virus, which is present on the virus surface, and which block infection in cell culture. It was also shown to block infection of non-human primates uh, with the virus. So this had never been tested in people, so it was given uh, to these uh, individuals who got sick. This monoclonal antibody, again, it's three different monoclonals. This is a structure of the viral glycoprotein in white uh, bound to the three different monoclonals. So they bind in different sites on the glycoprotein. It was raised in mice that were immunized with virus-like particles. So these are non-infectious virus particles. Uh, it was chimerized into a human IgG1 scaffold. So in other words, you take all of IgG1, except the, the antigen combining site, the hypervariable regions, uh, and you, put, uh, you take the human and you substitute the variable sequence with that from these antibodies. So now it's basically a human antibody, so it won't have a, a small half-life in serum. And then this, these antibodies are actually produced in tobacco plants, where you can make a lot of material cheaply. And so that was then uh, used for these individuals. And now it's going into proper phase one trials to make sure it's, it's safe. We don't actually know if this saved the lives of these individuals or not because of the trials weren't controlled at all. But it's a well-known passive vaccine. There's another really interesting uh, case of, uh, of passive, th passive therapy, which took place uh, in 1969, right at Columbia University Medical Center. Uh, at the time, Lassa virus had just emerged in Africa, a story that's described in this book, Fever. This is what made me want to be a virologist, this book, reading this book. Uh, and nurse in Nigeria, Penny Pinio, she's shown right here, she got infected. She was airlifted back to Colombia, put in the hospital, but she survived because she was lucky. And uh, they took a little bit of her serum and kept it. She went back to Nigeria to work. Uh, and then Yuri Casals was a virologist at Yale University, and he was trying to isolate the virus. And he uh, was mouth pipetting, which you shouldn't do, and got infected. So he was put at Columbia in the hospital, and they said, let's give him Penny's uh, blood. They transfused him with her blood, which they knew should have antibodies to the virus. And he was probably saved by this, although we don't know for sure, but he survived and lived on many years. So that's a cool story. All right, so let's go on to active vaccines now. What do you need to make a good, successful active vaccine? You have to induce the right immune response. Remember we talked about Th1 and Th2 responses, whether they're cellular versus antibody dominant. This differs according to the virus, and you need to know which one is important, and you have to induce that. There are some examples out there of people who made vaccines that induced the wrong Th response, and they weren't useful at all. You also have to protect the vaccinated individual. You can't just make antibodies or cells that react with the virus. They have to be protective. So you can easily determine in the lab whether immunizing with your vaccine generates uh, antibodies, but the only way you know if they can be protective in people is to do a clinical trial. And so you have to get your vaccine to the point where you know it's safe in people. You do a small scale phase one trial. And then you have to test it in people who are at risk for infection. You can't test them in people who are never going to be infected because you'll never find out 
if the vaccine is any good. This is a problem with current Ebola virus vaccines. There are quite a few out there. There's no more Ebola or very little Ebola in Western Africa. The, the outbreak is controlled. You can't test it now. It's going to be very difficult to do that. There are other considerations as well. The vaccine has to be safe, right? Because no vaccine is without side effects, but they have to be minimal. If you were developing a vaccine and you noticed it caused flu-like illness in recipients, would that be good or bad? Sorry, what did you say? It would be good. It would be meaning your innate response is picking it up and responding. A flu-like illness is good. So many vaccines are accompanied by a flu-like illness, soreness at the injection site, and so forth. You have to induce protective immunity. You do a clinical trial to show that's so. You would like it to be enduring or durable, long-lasting, so you have to follow your uh, immunized individuals for a period of time after, afterwards. And it should be cheap. Now, here in the U.S., this is not usually a determinant. You know, we have a number of vaccines that are very expensive. The, the papillomavirus vaccine is hundreds of dollars for a three-course immunization. Uh, if you travel and you need to get a hepatitis A virus vaccine, it'll set you back $150. But WHO wants a vaccine that costs less than a dollar if they're going to use it in their global programs. And so that, that's often difficult to achieve. Should be genetically stable, not revert. We'll talk about that today. Storage considerations. Do you have to freeze it or will it last at room temperature? Up until recently, all the vaccines we make have to be frozen. And that's a real problem in, in remote areas. The WHO actually developed a kerosene-fired freezer that's used to deliver polio vaccine in areas where there are no freezers. They put it on the back of pack animals and they go in and they can have their frozen polio vaccine. But now there are new technologies, which are amazing, we'll talk about briefly, that requ no, require no freezing at all. And finally, delivery. Again, most of our vaccines have been delivered by needle, but this is tough. Needles are expensive. Uh, you need a healthcare professional to, to immunize properly. You don't want anyone sticking a needle into the arm. So if you can deliver it other ways, it's much better, cheaper, and we'll talk about some alternatives to that as well. So let's go through some of the different ways to uh, make a vaccine. They're all illustrated here. You all start with a, a virulent virus for which you've identical, identified a medical need. If there isn't a medical need, if the virus infects five people a year, even though it kills all five of them, this is not unfortunately a medical need and a vaccine will not be developed because these are expensive. Uh, and then you can make a vaccine in different ways that are shown here. Uh, you can make an infectious virus vaccine. Uh, these viruses you make are attenuated in their virulence. We'll talk about those. You can inactivate the infectivity, make an inactivated virus vaccine. You can break it up and make a subunit vaccine. Or in more modern approaches, you can use molecular cloning to take genes that are important for generating an immune response, clone them into bacteria. And then you can, for example, make a, a live virus vectored vaccine. You can put uh, the genes of one virus into that of another. And that's one of the things being done with Ebola virus. You can do DNA vaccination. You can actually inject DNA into the muscle where it is nicely immunogenic and stimulates a good immune response to the gene that's encoded in the DNA. Uh, and then you can make various subunit or whole virus vaccines. You can just produce a single protein uh, of the virus that you've shown to be protective uh, and you can make a subunit vaccine. This is purified protein. In some cases, viral capsid proteins, when produced in heterologous systems, will assemble into a capsid. Remember, the structural proteins of virus capsids are, have evolved so they self-assemble into the capsid structure. So you could make a single viral protein and make an empty capsid out of it, and that has no genome. That's not infectious, but it's a good vaccine. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, that as well. So this is a list of some of the vaccines that are available to us now. Uh, it's a few years old, so it might be out of date, but I just want to show you what's available. Uh, some are available for everybody. So the influenza vaccines, for example, measles, mumps, papilloma, rotavirus, uh, polio, rabies. Rabies isn't given to everyone, but if you get bitten, you'll get a rabies vaccine. A smallpox vaccine no longer goes to everyone. Laboratory workers or the military get smallpox vaccine. The military is concerned 
uh, about someone using the virus as a bioterrorism weapon, so they immunize the military. There's our um, chickenpox vaccine and our shingles vaccine. And then there are others which are special use. There's an adenovirus vaccine just for military recruits. It's Japanese encephalitis, if you travel to uh, areas where the disease is present. Uh, the same with uh, yellow fever. If you go to areas where there is yellow fever, you should be immunized with this. But if you're just staying here in the US, you don't need to get a yellow fever vaccine because there's no yellow fever uh, here as far as we know. And these are prepared in different ways that we'll talk about today, and they have different schedules in terms of who gets them. Let's talk first about inactivated vaccines. This is where you take an infectious virus and you treat it with a chemical so that it's no longer infectious, but it still is antigenic. So if you inject it into someone, they're not going to get infected, but they will develop an immune response against the virus. And typically you use a variety of chemicals to inactivate the virus. Uh, and then you, of course, if you're developing this for a new virus, you have to go through a variety of, of testing procedures. I want to talk about two different inactivated vaccines with you. The first is against poliomyelitis. This is a disease that used to be common globally in the US, as I've told you. We used to have 20, 30, 40,000 paralytic cases a year and multiply that 100 times 100 to get the total number of infections. This is an interesting description from a 1959 textbook of medicine. If you have a textbook of medicine today, you will not have a description of polio because they don't, certainly here in the US, uh, it's not taught to medical students. Now, at Columbia, I do lecture medical students about polio, but I would guess that in most places in the US, they don't have polio virologists to do that. So students will uh, not really know much about the disease. Common acute viral disease, common. It's not common anymore. It's almost eradicated. An acute disease, you know what that is. Uh, and in many cases, it's just an asymptomatic or flu-like illness, and sometimes you get paralysis. Uh, the, the reason we have polio vaccines is because of Franklin Roosevelt, who had polio as a young man and was paralyzed. He couldn't walk. You can see him uh, being helped getting out of a car. I think there are only four pictures of him uh, showing him uh, either like this or in a wheelchair. He controlled his image very carefully, but he had polio. He lost function of his legs, and this really annoyed him. So he founded the March of Dimes, the fundraising effort for the National Foundation of Infantile Paralysis to raise money, and that money was used to develop the polio vaccines that we use today. He had kid, kids mail in dimes to the White House, okay? That was the March of Dimes. And he raised millions and millions of dollars, uh, and those were used to develop the vaccine. In the 30s and 40s in the U.S., hospitals were full of iron lungs because people would lose their respiratory function. They were put in here so that they could breathe until they, they regained it. You don't see any of these now, of course. Uh, polio, of course, is an RNA-containing icosahedral virus, relatively small, with a plus-stranded RNA genome. The first vaccine to be developed was an inactivated polio vaccine. It's called IPV. This was developed uh, by Jonas Salk, who went to NYU Medical School here in the city, got interested in uh, viral vaccines. He actually participated in the development of the first influenza vaccine. He treated influenza with formaldehyde or formalin to inactivate it. And then uh, he got funding from the National Foundation and applied the same approach to polio. Polio treated with formalin to destroy its infectivity. He did a huge clinical trial in 1954, 1 1.8 million children, the biggest ever done as far as we know and it gave reasonable protection, not great, 50%. It was licensed in April of 1955. And these are the headlines in New York City newspapers. You can see that polio was a big deal, all right? Nowadays, you, you rarely hear of it, but back then, it was sort of like the AIDS of the time. It paralyzed kids, and people were very upset of, about this. So you can see silk in the headlines and so forth. Uh, his vaccine uh, works by blocking virus in the blood. It induces antibodies, and that complexes with virus in the blood. Now, polio is acquired orally by fecal oral contamination. It replicates in the intestinal tract, shed in the feces. Uh, the virus replicates in mucosal surfaces and establishes a viremia. 
When you are immunized with IPV, the antibodies in your blood stop the virus there. This vaccine does not make mucosal antibodies. It's injected into your muscle. It makes wonderful antibodies in your blood, gives you a nice memory, but it doesn't prevent you from getting infected in the gut. However, when the virus gets into your blood, it will be complexed by the antibodies and that will stop it from getting into your central nervous system. So this vaccine was uh, introduced in 1955 and it led to a, se a severe reduction in the number of cases from about 20 to 30,000 a year down to 2,000 or so uh, by 1961. The other inactivated vaccine is the influenza vaccine. This is a different virus. It's an enveloped virus with a segmented genome of eight uh, different uh, RNA segments, as you know very well by now. There are three types, uh, A, B, and C, and we immunize only against types A and types B. There are between 3,000 and 50,000 deaths uh, in the U.S. every year, depending on the year. This is an average of the last 30 years or so, and that's why we vaccinate against the disease. This is a significant medical need. The vaccine, there's several types, but the main one that is used globally is grown in chicken eggs, embryonated chicken eggs. It propagates in the chicken cells uh, in the egg, uh, and then it's purified and activated with formalin and injected. And we manufacture quite a few doses every year. And it's, it's about 60% effective in people less than 65 years of, old, of age. It's not a great vaccine. It needs to be improved. This is now 1940s technology, and we need to replace it. But until we do, it's all that we have. Uh, the protection correlates with antibodies to the two surface proteins on the virus, the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase. Now, if you're allergic to feathers or egg proteins, you shouldn't take this. Instead, you should get a vaccine that's produced in cell culture. It's called flu cell vax. Unfortunately, they don't make as much of this. It's just harder to make in cell culture, so they often run out. The problem with the influenza vaccine is that the virus is highly antigenically variable. It can vary each year, and so your vaccination of one year may not be useful uh, the next year. So every January or so, WHO and, and national health authorities like CDC have to decide for the Northern Hemisphere what the flu strain is going to be in the fall. They have to take a guess, and they do a good guess, and then they, they make the vaccine uh, based on that guess. And they do this by guessing which strain it is. Then they take the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase segments of that strain and reassort it into a strain that grows well in chicken eggs so that they can produce a vaccine. Uh, so the, the vaccine um, for this year, this is, I had updated this, but it didn't propagate, is basically an H1N1 strain from 2009, uh, an H3N2 strain uh, from a subsequent year, and two different B virus strains. So every year they make a guess. Unfortunately, the H3N2 guess they made wasn't very good. There's been a lot of H3N2 influenza this year because uh, the virus turned out to be slightly different from what was put uh, into the vaccine. So obviously this is a problem uh, that we need to overcome. So this is a timeline of what's done every year to produce this influenza vaccine. There's global surveillance all year round uh, by the WHO Global Influenza Surveillance Network. These are thousands of laboratories all over the world that take respiratory specimens from people, they isolate virus, and they tell WHO uh, the sequence of that virus. In January, you can see they have to select the strains because there are months of preparation of reassortment, standardizing of antigens, uh, figuring out the potency and licensing before they can start vaccinating by the end of August. So the whole year is made up with all of the work that you have to do to be able to vaccinate. And then, of course, in the northern hemisphere, the flu season can start uh, in, in, about a, in about November. And there's, there's a big push to get elderly people to immunize very early on. So they typically go to CVS or uh, the, the drugstore to get their flu shots. And by February, in fact, their immunity has waned. It doesn't keep very well in, in the elderly, and so they could actually get influenza in February and even March as a consequence. Anyway, it's a long process, and uh, we need to fix it. So here's the influenza virus. The, the blue spikes are the hemagglutinin, and on the right is a model of the hemagglutinin uh, that shows you the antigenic sites. These are sequences on the protein that antibodies are directed against that will neutralize infectivity. 
And most of them you can see are, are located on the globular head of the protein. And it's, these are the parts of the protein that change every year as the virus undergoes mutation. So you can have one amino acid change in one of these epitopes and it'll prevent the antibody from binding. And that's why we need to do surveillance and figure out what we think is going to be uh, the circulating strain. Now these uh, other areas in a different part of the protein, this, this, this is what we call the stalk. And this, is, um, this doesn't vary. Uh, antibodies can bind these areas and block infectivity, but this area, because it's a structural component of the HA, does not undergo antigenic variation. So right now people are trying to figure out how to make a vaccine that induces antibodies to this stalk, because it turns out that these actually broadly neutralize many different influenza virus strains because this stalk is conserved. So in the next 10 years or so, you're going to see universal flu vaccines that are directed against this stalk region. So when you do, can you please remember that you heard it here first? Which statement about inactivated viral vaccines is incorrect? One, chemicals can be used to inactivate infectivity. Two, they do not replicate. Three, they can be dangerous if inactivation is not complete. Four, antigenic variation can make them ineffective. And five, none of the above are incorrect. None of the above are incorrect. 15, only 59% of you uh, got that right. Uh, they're all, none of them are incorrect. The chemicals can be used. None of you picked that. That's good. Uh, they do not replicate inactivated viruses. That's the definition, that the virus does not replicate. They can be dangerous if inactivation is not complete. Well, if inactivation is not complete, you would have infectious virus in the preparation. And I think you can see that that would be a problem. And antigenic variation can make them uh, ineffective. That certainly is correct. So it's none of the above. In fact, the first batches of inactivated polio vaccine, when they were released, immediately were followed by about 200 cases of polio in very specific states. And it turned out that one of the manufacturers hadn't followed the protocol properly, and some infectious virus was present in the vaccine. That's since been corrected, but it shows that if you don't do things properly, uh, you can have a problem. All right, so those are inactivated whole virus vaccines. Now let's talk about subunit vaccines. Here you can use two technologies. You can do the old school where you take the virus and you break it up, and maybe you purify the components and inject the ones that are important uh, into the individual, or you can clone the gene encoding that particular protein, express it in a variety of systems, bacteria, yeast, uh, insect cells, uh, mammalian cells, purify the protein, and use that as an immunogen. And usually the antigen that we're talking about cloning the gene for is a capsid protein or a membrane protein, a glycoprotein of an envelope virus. Now sometimes when you do this production of protein, like a capsid protein, it can assemble into empty virus particles. And there are a couple of vaccines uh, that are like that that I want to tell you about. So one example of a subunit vaccine produced by recombinant DNA technology is called FluBlock. It was just uh, licensed, um, sorry, it was just, I think it was licensed last year. Uh, what it entails is using a virus called baculovirus, which is an insect virus, to produce uh, a protein in insect cells. So what you do is you take the gene of interest, in this case it's the HA gene of influenza virus, you put it into a baculovirus vector, and then you infect insect cells in culture, and these cells will produce the hemagglutinin protein. They do it in these huge bioreactors. You can see here, this fellow is uh, standing next to one that's taller than he is, and the cells are swirling around in there, and they are producing, um, HA protein. And this HA protein actually uh, assembles into virus-like particles, which you can see in the right panel there. They can be purified. They have no genomic information, of course. It's just HA protein that happened to be assembling into this particle. And they uh, can be purified and injected. They're highly immunogenic. And um, they protect you against influenza. As you might guess, influenza is a pretty easy virus 
to test the new vaccine against because every year there is influenza in some part of the world, northern or southern hemisphere. So you can always find an at-risk population. Another interesting subunit vaccine is against hepatitis B virus. And here the gene encoding one of the uh, capsid proteins called HBS antigen is produced in yeast. And here's the viral uh, particle on the left here. It has an icosahedral capsid with its funny gapped double-stranded DNA genome and around it is an envelope in which uh, are inserted viral glycoproteins and the small one is shown here, the S, and that's the one that's produced and it assembles into uh, virus-like particles very much like uh, the one shown at the right here. So no genome, just the particle assembling by virtue of making just one viral glycoprotein, so similar to the HA making uh, virus-like particles in insect cells. Uh, and this is used to immunize people and it protects against infection. This was originally, this vaccine was originally produced uh, from human serum, from people who had been infected with hepatitis B. And uh, you can imagine the purification this had to go through to make sure it wasn't contaminated with any other uh, infectious agents. It was first produced at the onset of the AIDS epidemic, and so they had to be very careful to make sure there was no HIV in it. Another very good uh, subunit vaccine, which is in fact a virus-like particle vaccine, just like hepatitis B, is the vaccine against human papillomaviruses. These are viruses that cause papillomas or warts, and a certain number of the genotypes, uh, type 6, 11, 16, and 18, are associated with anogenital cancers. They're sexually transmitted viruses, and you have a, a risk of acquiring these and, and not only getting infected, but when you get these serotypes or genotypes, you have a, a high chance of getting cancer. So this is an anti-cancer vaccine. It's given to children in theory before they become sexually active. It will prevent the spread of the virus and it prevents them from developing cancers. Both boys and girls can get cancers from HPVs. And the way it works is a single gene, the virus has an icosahedral capsid, a single gene encoding the main capsid protein is produced uh, in yeast. The, the protein assembles <clears throat> into yeast or insect cells actually, two different companies do it two different ways. They assemble into empty capsids which are purified and then uh, used to immunize people. And these induce protective antibodies which will block infection. So this is a, an anti-cancer vaccine and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very effective. It's been shown now for about 10 years that it works very well. Now we talked about papillomaviruses last time about how you know, they have a T antigen-like gene that kicks the cells into mitosis so that the viral genome can replicate. Well, that's exactly how these viruses cause cancer in people. In a certain fraction of individuals who are infected, some, for some reason, the DNA encoding this T antigen is separated from the rest of the genome and integrates into the cell and it becomes constitutively expressed. And as soon as you make this T antigen uh, in the cell, the cells keep dividing and dividing, and eventually they will accumulate mutations that will make them cancerous. The most famous person to be infected with HPV-18 is Henrietta Lacks. Her, her cervical tumor in 1951 was used to make HeLa cells, which are still used in many laboratories today. It wasn't known at the time why she had a cervical tumor, but we can see integrated into those HeLa cells, into her genome, HPV sequences encoding the T antigen. That's why these cells are immortal, because they keep making the T antigen, which keeps making the cells divide by antagonizing P53 and binding up RB and so forth that we talked about last time. In the future, what's, what are we going to have? Well, one of them is a virus-like particle of influenza virus produced uh, in plants. And here, what you do is just make the HA, similar to what was done in the insect virus. Uh, you, you make it in plants, and you generate uh, particles which are highly immunogenic and safe to administer to people. This has been put through already a phase two trial for uh, efficacy. The neat thing about this is that you can make it very cheaply, a square meter of plants, right, produces 20,000 doses, less than 20 cents a dose. 
much, much cheaper than making uh, the vaccine either in eggs or uh, in cell cultures. So that's really going to be very interesting. And the second advantage is that you can make this very quickly. So uh, when a new pandemic strain of flu emerges every 20, 30, 40 years, the whole world gets infected, you have lots of deaths, you'd like to be able to make a vaccine very quickly. Problem is, if you identify a pandemic strain here at day zero, by the time you can make an egg-based vaccine, it's already six, seven, or eight months, you've already gone through the first pandemic wave, which is this red peak right here. And in 2009, when the H1N1 pandemic strain emerged, we missed the first wave. We didn't get the vaccine out until it was over. These, these vaccines where you just produce an HA protein, you could theoretically make very quickly. So if you get the pandemic strain within hours, you can get the sequence of the HA, you can put it uh, into plants, and you can start making uh, within a few weeks uh, enough vaccine to immunize. So here they estimate by four months they would have enough supply to uh, immunize a lot of people. So this is the advantage of having this kind of technology where you don't have to grow virus, you just use the sequence to make uh, the protein that you need for uh, virus-like particles. Now, these subunit vaccines have a lot of advantages, but they also have disadvantages. They're common in DNA, so there's no viral genome, there's no infectious virus, as I've told you, these virus-like particles. That's great. It minimizes uh, side effects, but the disadvantages are they're expensive, uh, although once the development phase is over, that should be taken care of. They typically have to be injected, although as I'll show you, we can work on that as well. And they have poor antigenicity compared to an infectious vaccine. And what, the reason is that viral proteins, of course, and virus-like particles don't replicate. They don't infect cells. And remember, when a virus infects cells, and in particular a cytopathic virus infects cells and kills it, that's when you have a nice strong innate response and a strong adaptive response because the dendritic cells and so forth are picking up the pieces of dead and dying cells and presenting them. So these viral proteins and virus-like virus particles don't do that. They don't send out danger signals, so they're not as immunogenic as an infectious virus. One way around this is to add something to the vaccine to mimic the induction of an innate response, and these are called adjuvants, right? And that mimics the inflammatory effects of a cytopathic virus infection. So here are some examples of adjuvants uh, that have been used. So uh, one of them, for example, uh, AS4, is uh, monophosphorolipid A. That's shown at the right here. This is a, a ligand for toll-like receptor 4. Remember, if you stimulate the toll-like receptors with the appropriate ligand, whether it's RNA or a protein, they will induce the production of cytokines. They will start the inflammatory process, which is giving you the flu-like symptoms, but it's also telling you that you're going to get a good antibody response. So incorporating this into uh, virus like particle vaccines or subunit vaccines makes them more immunogenic. There are other adjuvants as well. The HPV vaccine has aluminum hydroxide, uh, which acts as an adjuvant. And um, in Europe, the influenza vaccines use this compound called MF59, which is an oil and water emulsion. So one of the ways these, these um, adjuvants work is by stimulating innate ligands like TLL4, but they also work by concentrating the antigen. So if they're injected, uh, if, if a plain soluble antigen is injected, it diffuses away from the injection site pretty quickly. But if it's mixed with oil and made as an emulsion, the, it releases very slowly from the inoculation site. And that seems to also uh, help immune responses. So we'll be seeing more and more of these adjuvants added as we move more and more to subunit and, and uh, virus-like particle vaccines. Unfortunately, they have more side effects. They have more pain at the site of injection because they're stimulating inflammation, but that's good. Unfortunately, people don't like that, so they're more likely to, uh, to reject it. Some other really interesting new vaccine technologies, uh, the problem of a needle injection, it seems to be overcome by using these microneedle patches. These are synthetic polymers, uh, which are in the form of a square, as you can see here, and on one side, they're tiny needles which, if placed on the skin, will just go into the epidermis. So what you do here is you coat these with vaccine, 
and then they're simply band-aided to your arm and you wear them for a few days. The antigen goes into the skin where there are lots of dendritic cells patrolling. They pick up the antigen and make a great immune response. It turns out that skin immunization is a really good way to get a good response to the antigen. So this is now being tested and I'll bet this is gonna come into use quickly and you won't have to inject many of our vaccines. This will be great. The other issue is thermostability. And uh, it's been dis discovered that if you mix vaccines with either silk from, from uh, the, the insects that produce silk, there's, the, there's a tube full of their cocoons, or various sugars. So you simply take the vaccine, you mix it with silk or sugars, you dry it. This becomes incredibly thermostable. So here's an example of that on this graph. We're looking at residual potency. Uh, this is an infectious virus vaccine, so we're measuring infectivity with storage time uh, at different temperatures. And here are the black uh, squares. I think this is a measles vaccine. You can see without any addition, without any sugars or silk, uh, you lose infectivity uh, relatively quickly. This is a high temperature, 45 degrees centigrade, but not unlike one you might encounter in some tropical areas. Now, if you add in uh, various components, I don't recall which is which, you can see you, st you thermostabilize this preparation. In particular, the top curve the diamonds, is very stable for 25 weeks at 45C. This is great. So you don't have to refrigerate it. The idea is, of course, you will use it up quickly, but this is going to revolutionize uh, the costs involved with uh, storing and administering vaccine. A universal flu vaccine is going to happen. I want to tell you just a bit more of that. I showed you before the structure of the HA with the head epitopes that vary. These, again, these are the epitopes against which antibodies are directed that neutralize infectivity. The stem region epitopes are conserved. They don't change. So people are trying to figure out uh, how to induce these antibodies, which are broadly neutralizing. They'll, they'll neutralize almost every strain of flu. So the antigenic variation from year to year won't matter anymore because you'll have this universal vaccine protecting you. This would be great. And so uh, people have experimented with making HA proteins of different sorts. Here's the complete HA protein with the globular head uh, and the, the fibrous stem. And in the stem, of course, that is where these highly conserved epitopes are located. And they've, they've experimented with headless HAs like this one. They cut off the globular head and immunize with simply that protein as well. So these are still in early days of testing. They haven't even uh, reach the point where they're, where they're finished in animals. There's still a lot of development to go, but as I said, this is going to happen in the next 10 years or so, and it's going to revolutionize uh, immunization against influenza virus. What are some requirements for an effective vaccine? Low cost, ease of administration, provides long-lasting immunity, minimal side effects, or all of the above. All right, that's an easy one. Good. Let's uh, end up talking about infectious vaccines. Now, you will see these referred to as live attenuated vaccines or live natural virus vaccines. Uh, but as that's the term they were given years ago. I don't really like using live when, when I talk about a virus, so I try and call them replication competent or infectious. But basically, these are vaccines where the virus is infectious. It replicates when it's given to you, and it stimulates an immune response, but of course, not disease, because that's one of the properties of a vaccine. The idea is that an infectious vaccine, shown on the bottom, you get one dose, it replicates in the host, and you get a very strong immune response as opposed to an inactivated vaccine shown on the top where you have to give multiple boosters to get a good immune response because the virus is not replicating. It's very clear. The way these are made in the old days anyway, the, the polio vaccine, the measles, mumps, rubella, these are all uh, infectious attenuated vaccines made by old technology. You would take a virus that's pathogenic in humans and you would then grow it in some other cell type like here is a human virus being grown in a monkey cell, and you keep passing it from one culture to another until the virus changes enough so that it will no longer cause disease in people. And this is the way uh, vaccines of this sort used to be developed. Uh, one I want to tell you about is called flu mist. This is an infectious intranasally administered flu vaccine. Uh, the health person puts a syringe up your nose without a needle, of course, and sprays the vaccine in. 
It's, a, it's just like the egg vaccine. It can be grown in eggs. It is multivalent with different components, and they are reassortants just like the egg-based vaccine is. But these viruses are cold adapted and temperature sensitive and attenuated in a ferret model for flu. So what does that mean? Cold adapted means they prefer to replicate in the upper respiratory tract from the, from the neck up. So that causes milder disease. They don't go down into the lung, which is where or the trachea, which is where flu prefers and where it causes disease. Temperature sensitive also prevents them from going down into the lung because the temperature is higher there. So they don't cause disease, they give you good immunity. If you have a choice, take this vaccine. I think this is the best flu vaccine so far. It mimics a natural infection. It's not broken up by detergents and so forth. I think it gives you the, the most robust immunity. Polio vaccine is also a infectious attenuated vaccine. And this is produced uh, by passage in different hosts. This was done by Albert Sabin. And there are three different serotypes of polio, and, and the vaccine contains all three. And Albert Sabin passed all three serotypes in different hosts, from monkeys, various cell cultures, and so forth, and just empirically identified a virus that could not cause disease in monkeys, and then it was tested in humans. So this is not a directed exercise. You just pass your virus and put it into an animal, see if it paralyzes. If not, you go back and you pass it some more. So the three vaccine serotypes of Sabin, which we still use today, along with the IPV that I talked about, these are very effective at uh, preventing polio. Now these viruses are basically mutants, which were selected for during the passage in these different cell cultures and animals. In the 1980s, it was possible to sequence the genome of these mutants many years after Sabin had developed them, and these are the individual mutations in the three strains that make these vaccines attenuated, that is, make them not cause polio when they're given to individuals. You can see there are not many changes. Uh, there are five in the type one and two each in the other two strains. And in fact, if you tried to license this vaccine today, you would be required by the FDA to, sh to know its sequence, and these would not be licensed because they're too close to the parent viruses. Uh, you would be required to make vaccines that differ enough so that genetic stability uh, would be ensured. We've talked about the fact that all three strains have a mutation in the five prime non-translated region, and that is a main determinant of the attenuation phenotype. If you remember the polio genome, it's a plus-stranded RNA with a, a long non-coding region at the five prime end that folds into an RNA structure that makes it an iris, an internal ribosome entry site. And it's within one of these stem loops of the iris, stem loop five, expanded on the right here. That's where the mutations are in these three vaccine strains that are very important for attenuation, type one, uh, type two, and type three. So this is an example of an attenuation determinant in a non-coding region. So the way these vaccines are used, you drink them. You simply drink cell culture fluid with infectious virus in it. The virus replicates in the mucosa of your intestinal tract. You shed viruses for a period of time, uh, but you immunize the gut. You get secretory IgA that protects the gut, and then a virus, of course, gets into the blood, uh, and you get a good antibody response there as well. So you protect both against infection and transmission to the central nervous system. In the U.S., this vaccine replaced IPV in 1961 and led to the eradication of polio uh, in the U.S., so today we have no more poliomyelitis in the U.S., However, there was a problem with this vaccine, and that is in a certain fraction of kids, one in one and a half million, it caused polio. And that's shown on this slide. This is the reported cases of polio from 1961 to 2003 in the US. The line is the total number of paralytic cases. And so there were a few thousand a year still in 1961. We switched from uh, IPV to OPV in 1961-62. The bars are the cases of polio caused by the vaccine. They were typically 8 to 10 or 12 every year. You can see them starting when the vaccine was first used. And eventually when wild polio, the circulating virus, was eradicated, which happened in 1980, the only cases of polio in the U.S. were caused by the vaccine. And so in 2000, we switched back to uh, IPV because this risk was no longer acceptable. 
and there's no more vaccine-associated polio. Now, why does the vaccine cause polio? Is it defective? Well, no, it's not, because in most cases, in most kids who are immunized, it doesn't cause uh, any paralysis. But uh, studies have been done like this one, which show that shortly after you're given this vaccine, the virus goes into your gut and it replicates. The virus that's shed begins to revert. So this is a, a child of a, a polio virologist in the UK. He took his firstborn son and he took all of his diapers for the first three months of his life, brought them to the lab and uh, isolated polio and sequenced it. And this is the sequence at 472 in the five prime non-coding region, which is one of the important determinants of attenuation. This is for the type three strain. So the vaccine has a U, and if you inject this vaccine into monkeys, you can calculate its virulence by doing a histological lesion score. It's very low. Uh, so now at 24 hours after vaccination, uh, DM is, is excreting virus with a U, so it still looks vaccine-like. But look, at 35 hours, not even two days, this base is already reverting to the C, which is the, the, the base in the wild-type virus, uh, and this virus is getting more virulent in, the, in this assay. You can see the 47-hour sample has a very high lesion score. So this, if this were a vaccine being tested for release, this would fail release. It's too neurovirulent. And after 18 days, uh, the, the child is still shedding virus with a C. So the C makes the virus virulent. In fact, it turns out that every child that gets polio vaccine, the virus reverts within two days in the gut and the child is shedding viruses with a C for this serotype and with the reverted bases for all the other two serotypes. So why, why does one in one and a half million kids get paralyzed? Well, we don't know. My theory is they have a SNP in one of the innate response genes. Okay, I bet if we could sequence those genes of these individuals, we'd find that they have a TLR or an UNC93B or Rig I or MDA5 mutation that makes them more susceptible to vaccine-associated polio. I'm not sure that study will ever be done, unfortunately, but that's my theory, and, and I think that's why we get this. Now, nevertheless, uh, this was unacceptable after 2000 or so in the U.S., and that's why we switched. Now, in 1988, the World Health Organization uh, made a resolution to eradicate polio. This is the timeline. Uh, they wanted to eradicate by 2005 and eventually stop immunizing. All right, so th this would remove a, a large burden of health costs on the world. But also, they're using the Sabin vaccine, which we know reverts. They don't want to keep on immunizing because you'll keep on getting cases of vaccine-associated poliomyelitis. Well, we've not reached this goal, obviously. It's 2015 now, and we're still immunizing. But let me uh, tell you where we are. First question is an interesting one. Can you eradicate a virus disease or any disease? And so far, smallpox is the only human uh, virus infection that we have eradicated. Smallpox is a nasty disease. causes very painful uh, lesions and can also kill you. Uh, this campaign was launched in 1967. The virus was eradicated in 1978. No more smallpox globally. We don't immunize, as I said, except for the military. To eradicate an infection, you need two features. One host, humans only, and infection confers lifetime immunity. So if your virus is in more than one host, you can't eradicate it. So given that, do you think we could eradicate measles? So humans are the only host for measles, so we could. How about influenza? No, flu infects all kinds of birds and seals and other animals as well. No way we're going to eradicate flu. So any virus that has a non-human host, forget about it. But polio fits the bill. It's one host, humans, and infection gives you uh, lifetime immunity. The other, the other issue is that, of course, the polio vaccine is very different from smallpox. Polio vaccine can cause polio, whereas the smallpox vaccine uh, never did. And so that's why uh, the WHO decided to stop immunizing with polio vaccine once they could eradicate it because it causes polio. It's completely logical. Now, a number of years ago, um, there were outbreaks of polio in these countries. Turned out they were all caused by vaccine-derived polio. So you get immunized with polio. You shed virus in the stool, and after 24 or 48 hours, that's all revertant virus that is neurovirulent. 
that can spread in the population. Uh, and in fact, there are people who, uh, spread, who ex excrete these uh, vaccine-derived polioviruses for years, 20 and 30 years. These are immunocompromised people who lack B cells. They can't make antibodies to clear the vaccine virus, so they shed it forever, and they, are a central they play a central role in spreading these vaccine viruses globally. So because of this, it's been decided that we have to transition back to the Salk vaccine. You can't just stop immunizing with OPV because there'll be lots of circulating OPV and that will reinfect any new kids who are born. So WHO has said we're going to eradicate with OPV and then as soon as we can certify that there's no more wild virus, we'll switch to the injected IPV. Maybe by then we'll have a, a microneedle patch to deliver it uh, and then uh, eradicate by then. So basically, we have to vaccinate against the vaccine. We have to stop using OPV uh, and then transition to IPV. So this is uh, the current recommendations of, of WHO. Uh, previously, they were giving three doses of OPV. They've now included a dose of IPV uh, to try the tr to do the transition. The good news is that we are only having type 1 polio globally. Types 2 and 3 have already been uh, eradicated. Uh, and they recommend a variety of schemes. One is an IPV OPV schedule where you're worried about vaccine associated polio. So you give a dose of, of IPV first and then the OPV will not cause any issues. Uh, and then if you have a, a lot of coverage as we do in the US, you can use IPV only. So we'll see how this goes. So far we've done really well. So here's polio in 1988, 125 endemic countries. Those are countries that have polio, uh, 71 polio free countries, uh, 1998, down to 40 polio endemic countries, uh, and 2008, five polio endemic countries. Now today, this is the situation as of March. The only three countries in the world where we have not interrupted wild polio transmission have been Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Nigeria. And last year, 2014, there were 300 and some odd cases of wild polio in those three countries. Uh, so far this year, there are uh, 10 cases, this is 2015, 12 cases, uh, mainly in Pakistan and, and Afghanistan, nothing in Nigeria. So Nigeria has been polio free for six months, which is really an accomplishment. So if they go to the end of 2015 without any polio, they'll be declared uh, polio free. And then the real problem is here in Afghanistan and Pakistan where you can't get in to immunize people. Right? The, the people who are doing the immunizing are getting shot uh, and there's conflict going on. So if we could go in and immunize everyone, the polio would be gone from there as well. And again, this is all using Sabin infectious virus. So we still have to transition to IPV and go for a period until all those circulating vaccine-derived polioviruses go away. It's not a trivial pro process. But if we can get rid of the last cases, I think this is an incredible accomplishment, considering that in 1988, there were probably over 400,000 global cases of paralytic disease. Really interesting. However, as long as you have the sequence of any virus out there, we have the sequence of the polio genome, you can make virus again. It's published. You can go onto your computer, go to PubMed and search for polio genome. You'll get the whole sequence. And you could have it synthesized and just put that synthetic DNA in cells and you'll get virus out. You could do the same with pretty much any other virus. You could do it with smallpox if you wanted to. So what are we going to do? We can't really ever eradicate a virus, right? Somebody could say, well, I'm going to bring polio back. So unfortunately for polio, what we have to do is stockpile vaccine. That's why we stockpile smallpox vaccine. We have smallpox antivirals in the case of an outbreak. We're going to have to stockpile uh, polio vaccine as well. So you have to remember that eradication may not be uh, forever.